Discover Geography, Lesson 2-4, Data. We'll start this lesson on data with a cautionary tale. A few years back, there was a state senator in Minnesota by the name of Alan Quist, who was going around showing this map that you see on the screen to all of his colleagues. And he was pointing out to them that on the right side of that map is the southern hemisphere, and you see a big continent there that is entirely free of ice. You can see rivers and mountains and so forth there. And he said, look, all these people are all worried about global warming, and they're all worried that the ice caps are melting. Well, look, here's a map from the 1500s that shows no ice at the South Pole. And civilization didn't end in the 1500s. It was not a huge crisis. So what are we so worried about? The problem is that while this is, in fact, a map from the 1500s, What's shown there at the South Pole is not based on any sort of data or exploration of the South Pole. No one had been to the South Pole at this point in time. No one had ever even seen Antarctica. The landmass that's shown at the South Pole there was entirely invented by the cartographer who made this map. And so it doesn't actually tell us anything about what was going on at the South Pole in the 1500s. And in fact, the current ice cap at the South Pole has been there for hundreds of thousands of years. So Alan Quist made the mistake of only looking at some of the metadata on this map. Metadata is data about data. It's information that tells us about the quality of the data that lies behind that map. The metadata on that map would have told us not only that it had been made in the 1500s, but also that certain parts of that map were based on the records of certain explorers, other parts were entirely invented. And if Alan Quist had read the entire metadata on that map, he wouldn't have made that mistake. Here's another map, one we've seen before, with a little bit of metadata about it. So this is the map showing the correlation between the racial makeup of different neighborhoods of Detroit and the location of hazardous waste facilities. So some of the metadata that we might look up on this map were things like the author. Well, I made this map, Stentor Danielson. The date that it was made. This map was made in August of 2011. The data source. So in this case, the racial composition data came from the 2010 US Census, and the hazardous waste facility locations came from a database called the Toxics Release Inventory maintained by the US EPA. And I grabbed that data from the 2010 edition of the TRI. And then the data was processed using a program called QGIS. Based on all that information, we can figure out how trustworthy that map is. So for example, US Census data is pretty reliable data for getting the demographic composition of different parts of a city. So based on that, we can say, OK, that aspect of the map is probably pretty reliable. We know that it was made by me. So if you trust me to make good maps, to accurately represent the information, then that gives you an indication that this is a good map. If you don't trust me, then that might be a strike against this map. You always want to think about the metadata on any map. Who made it? When did they make it? What's the basis of it? Where did this data come from? When we evaluate data that goes into the map, there are several different things that we want from that data, several different characteristics that make for good data. First, that data should be accurate. It should represent what's really going on on the Earth. So as a counterexample, when I moved into the apartment I lived in a few years ago, I paid a little extra to get an off-street parking space. And so the apartment complex, there's three buildings, Bryant, Lincoln, and Grant, and they sent me the map that you see there to show me where I should park. And they said, you've got parking space six. When I got to the apartment complex, what I found was something a little more like the bottom picture there. The parking lot only extended across behind the Grant building, not behind all of the buildings. And there were nine different parking spots in that parking lot. So I had a bit of confusion for a while about where exactly I was supposed to park because the map was inaccurate. It didn't show what was really there on the Earth. Data should also be relevant. You should use the right data for the map that you're trying to make. Based on what the purpose of your map is, that will tell you which data is relevant and which data is not relevant, even if it might seem relevant. One common confusion that a lot of people end up having is the confusion between absolute values and percentages. So you see on the screen there two different maps showing the population over age 65 in different states of the United States. 
on the left is the absolute number. This is just the total number of old people in each state. On the right, you see the percent of the population that's over age 65. So on the first map, you can see California is by far the state with the most old people, has the largest number of old people. But when you look at the map on the right, you see that the percentage elderly in California's population is actually fairly low compared to other states. California has a lot of old people, but it also has a lot of middle-aged and younger people. So those old people make up a smaller percentage of the population, even though there's a large number of them. On the other hand, if you look at West Virginia, West Virginia has a very small total number of old people, but West Virginia's overall population is so small that those old people actually make up a larger percentage of West Virginia's population, which you can see on the map on the right. Now, which data is better? Which data is more relevant? Well, it depends on what the purpose of your map is. If you're interested in seeing which states are going to need a larger chunk of federal appropriations for Social Security and Medicare, then you want to know the total number of people. You want the map on the left. California is going to need a lot more dollars than West Virginia because there are a lot more old people who have Social Security checks to collect, etc. On the other hand, if you want to look at the ratio between older and younger people, if you want to see, for example, how state programs to help the elderly are going to be able to get enough tax revenue from within the state, from the working age people, to support their older population, then you want the percentage. You want the ratio between older and younger people. And so in that case, you can see that California is in pretty good shape. West Virginia has fewer total old people, but even less younger people. And so those older people would potentially put more of a strain on the state budget if there are a lot of state programs uh, for the elderly. Data should also be consistent. If you have multiple different pieces of data that you're putting together, they should play well together. They should match up with each other. This is a map that I made in grad school where I was combining different factors that might influence the risk of a wildfire in a certain portion of Australia. And if you look carefully at that map, you see a lot of vertical streaks running through it. That's not because fire danger has these vertical streaks of less danger in it. That's because two of the different types of data that I was combining were at different spatial resolutions. And so when I tried to match them up, it left that kind of streaky pattern. That's an artifact of how I mashed this data together. That's not an actual feature of the world. So you want your data to play nice with each other, to be consistent across different data sets. Data for a map can come in a variety of different forms. The two main forms that we're interested in are what are called vector and raster formats. Vector data consists of either points, lines, or polygons. And so you can see on that map there, I've got all three formats being shown. So you've got points, the little red dots, they might represent, for example, uh, groundwater test wells. And so a point has a location. It has no width or, or breadth. It's just a specific spot on the Earth, a latitude and longitude coordinate. A line is one-dimensional. It goes across the Earth's surface. In some of your readings, you may see them referred to as polylines because technically, mathematically speaking, a line is perfectly straight. And so if you have a series of straight segments making up a larger curved uh, unit, that's a polyline. But we use the terms line and polyline interchangeably in this context. And so those lines might represent roads, and so they show where the road goes. And then you've got polygons. Those might represent forests and a lake, and those cover area. Those are two-dimensional shapes showing the boundaries of a particular area. On the right, you see that same information done in a raster format. Raster data consists of a grid of cells or pixels. Those are all those little squares that it's made up of. And so for each pixel, you have a value. So what's on that pixel on the ground? Is it a forest on that, in that pixel? Is there water in that pixel or whatever? When we look into vector data, we see there are actually two components that make up a vector data set. So what you see on the screen here is a screenshot out of a computer program where I was working with some vector data. And this was data on the various countries of the world. So one component of that vector data is what we call the geometry. The geometry is the where part. 
where is this thing located? What are the boundaries of this particular object? So in this case, we've got polygons. Each polygon shows the territory of a given country. So the geometry shows what are the boundaries of that country, where are the edges of that country. And so what you see there highlighted in yellow is the country of Belgium. So the geometry shows where is Belgium. Then attached to those geometries, we have a whole series of attributes, a whole series of pieces of information about Belgium. And so these are pieces of information that attach to the country as a whole. Belgium is one thing, one object in this data set, and it has a variety of pieces of data attached to it. So things like the total population, the total area, the percent of people that live in cities, and a variety of other things I've got in my database. And so then I can turn on or off those different pieces of data. So I could display, you know, in various colors like a choropleth map, the populations of all those countries or the population densities of all those countries, etc. So we've got the geometry that shows where these objects are, and then each object can have a whole series of attributes, a whole series of pieces of information about that thing. In raster data, we have this grid of cells or pixels. So here is this is actually a satellite image. So each pixel is what color did the satellite see when it basically took a picture of the ground right there. And I've zoomed way in on it so you can see the pixels distinctly. You can see that this is made up of all these little squares, each of which is a slightly different color. So how do we get this data? How do we create one of these databases that we can make a map of? Well, one approach is surveying. We can actually go out to those places and measure their locations and then record information about each location, write down and then put into our database what was going on at each of these spots that we measured. Surveying is done through a process called triangulation. So let's say we want to know the location of point C on this little diagram. We're going to start with the known location of point A. Point A is some sort of benchmark. We know exactly where that is. We know its coordinates. We're then going to measure the location of point B. The first thing we're going to do is find out the distance. We're going to have some sort of a ruler or surveys typically have a chain. Right? So a chain is of a fixed length that's not going to stretch or squish. And you'll measure out from A to B using the chain. And you know exactly the distance from A to B. Then you can measure the angle between due north from A and a line of sight from A to B. So when you see surveyors looking through those little scopes, that's what they're doing. They're finding that line of sight and measuring its angle. Once we know the distance from A to B and the angle between due north and the A to B line, then we can calculate the coordinates of B. Once we have A and B, we can then measure the angle between the line of sight to C from A and the line of sight from B to C and use that to calculate the location of C. So we know the distance between A and B and we know those two angles, then some basic geometry we can calculate the location of C. And once we have the location of C, we can do the same process to calculate the location of D, E, etc. and just work our way across the landscape measuring all these angles and calculating the exact locations of these different points. This technique was used to map pretty much the entire United States in the days before satellite technology. Now today we have satellite technology that allows us to do things much easier if we don't need an extreme level of detail. You still see surveying used for things like construction sites because you need a lot of very specific local detail that you can't get from satellite measurements. But we also now have something called GPS, the Global Positioning System, that can use satellite data to give you your location to a pretty high degree of accuracy. The way the GPS does that is by receiving signals from a series of satellites that are orbiting the Earth. Each of these satellites is constantly transmitting a message, and that message is essentially the time. That satellite has an extremely accurate clock on it, and it broadcasts out the exact time. Your GPS device, so that could be a GPS device in your phone, you might have one in your car, you might have a specialized GPS recorder device that you're using for map making, also has an accurate clock on it. 
So when it receives the signal, it can say, aha, that signal was sent a certain amount of time ago. Because it's saying it's a certain time, but it's actually, we've gone a, a little beyond that by the time the signal got here. And we know the speed that those signals go, and we know the locations of those satellites in their orbits at any one given time. From all that information, your GPS can calculate exactly where you are. And so it's always looking for whatever satellites are overhead and calculating your distance from those satellites based on the time lag of those signals that are being broadcast by the satellite. So you can go around to different places, record their exact location with GPS, and then record some information about what's going on there. The last important way that we get data from apps is through what's called remote sensing. And that's exactly what the name sounds like. It's sensing the surface of the Earth remotely from a distance. So this includes things like aerial photography out of a plane or satellite imagery. We send up a satellite like the one you see on the screen. That's the Landsat 7 satellite. It's a very important satellite for observing the surface of the Earth. And that satellite's essentially going to keep taking pictures of the Earth as it orbits. And we can use those pictures to find out what's going on on the surface of the Earth. Any satellite sensor or other remote sensor is going to have what we call a spectral resolution. That tells us what wavelengths of radiation are we measuring. And you see there on the slide the electromagnetic spe spectrum. There are a whole variety of different wavelengths of energy that our satellites might sense. Visible light, the light that we can actually see with our eyes, is a very tiny fraction of that electromagnetic spectrum. So our satellites could be sensing that. They could be looking for ultraviolet light. They could be looking for infrared light. They could be sensing microwaves. Whatever type of radiation that they're looking for, that is the spectral resolution of that satellite. We can then use those different levels of radiation at different wavelengths to figure out what is it that's on the ground there. So what you see here are some spectral profiles for different types of things that might be on the ground. So you can see how different types of land cover are going to emit different amounts of radiation at different wavelengths. If you focus on the first two there, the solid red line that represents alfalfa, it's a common crop, and the dotted green line that represents maple trees, what you'll see is within the visible spectrum for those, you see kind of a peak in the middle of the visible spectrum. The middle is green. So alfalfa and maple trees both look green to us, because all we can see is what's in that visible spectrum and the largest portion of radiation that's being reflected off them within that bracket is green light. However, remote sensors can sense other wavelengths. So they might look at infrared light as well. And you can see that living plants like alfalfa and maple trees emit a huge amount of near infrared light, even more than they emit visible green light. And so if our remote sensor can sense infrared radiation as well, it can help us make a more accurate assessment of what kind of growth is there and what kind of state is it in. Is it growing healthily or is it uh, not doing so well? So we can match up the profile, the different wavelengths that we're sensing from any one spot on the Earth with the profiles we expect for certain types of land cover and then we can figure out what's actually there. Remote sensors will also have a spatial resolution. The spatial resolution tells you how much detail it can see. Remote sensing data is done in raster format. You can convert it to vector format. You can look at that and identify where the roads are and create a vector polyline along that road, etc. But the raw data starts in raster format. And so the spatial resolution is essentially the question, how big are the pixels? If you have fine scale imagery, the pixels are very small, so you can see a lot of detail. If you have coarse scale imagery, the pixels are very wide, and so you can see a lot less detail. The two images there come from two different satellites. One of them has 2.4 meter wide pixels. One has 30 meter wide pixels. So the smaller pixels give you a lot more detail. They also give you a lot bigger data files. So if you don't need that level of detail, if you're looking at something across a very broad scope of the world, you can use that coarse scale imagery. 
It'll make your data a lot more manageable and you don't need that data. But if you want to zoom in and look at the very fine details of something, then you want remote sensors with a very high spatial resolution.